Steve Flying M Speed and Airmotive. Today, as you can see behind me, we're working on the Soaring by the Sea Foundation's PBY-5A. Uh, this particular aircraft is noteworthy in that it actually has a confirmed U-boat kill during World War II while uh, being flown by the Royal Canadian Air Forces. Um, I had to bring the book here to get the specifics, but uh, it was flying with 162 Squadron of the Royal Canadian Air Force on 17th of April 1944 under the command of Flying Officer T. Cook, that's Tom Cook. Uh, the Canso attacked and sunk German U-boat U-342, which was on weather reporting duties south of Iceland. So, yeah, this is one of, uh, I believe, two surviving PBYs that has a confirmed U-boat kill. So, pretty significant airplane. Uh, we came into involvement uh, because, well, as you might be able to see behind me, uh, she's down for some maintenance, and uh, it's been down for a little while getting some pretty extensive maintenance done. And uh, they needed a little help uh, meeting their timeline, getting it back together, so they called us in. So while I'm thinking about it, I want to give you a little more history on this airplane. Uh, so despite having sunk a U-boat during World War II, um, this airplane went on post-war to become an airliner. And it server served as an airliner in Canada for uh, a bunch of years. And then it um, was ultimately converted into a tanker in the 70s, and so it was a water bomber. Uh, there's actually um, openable doors in the bottom of the aircraft uh, that um, would feed a, a water, or I'm sorry, that led to a water tank, water internal water stowage tank. And uh, there was actually a big scoop that would come out uh, the bottom of the airplane. Um, and so basically the tanker pilot would come into a body of water touch down in the water and lower the scoop and that scoop would fill up a several hundred gallon tank in very short order and then they'd retract that scoop once full and take back off and go drop, drop the loads on the fire. Um, the doors are still in place to empty the tank however the scoop and everything's been removed the doors have been sealed shut but uh, they're still there which is kind of neat. Um, so it was an airliner it was a tanker then it was an airliner again um, then it went into private hands, and this aircraft um, has really been kind of, uh, I want to say all over the world, but not quite, just most of it. Um, it was used in Africa to film a, a nature documentary quite a bit, and so it had cameras mounted on the wings and the tail and fuselage, and uh, it was a, fl a flying camera platform. And so it flew all over Africa filming um, landing in the rivers and stuff there and uh, has a lot of history there. It was in France for a bunch of years before the current owners acquired it and they actually flew it back across the Atlantic to the U.S. which was another adventure in its own right which uh, had to have been a really cool trip. Um, so yeah I just wanted to fill you in on a little of the, the history of the airplane and uh, yeah it, it's been flying for most of the time since the war um, just on and off but it's uh, you know unlike some it, it didn't go into storage for a long period of time it's kind of been active for majority of the time um, so it's kind of neat it's got a lot of history to it and it's a really cool airplane um, it's got 80 years of history and um, yeah it's uh, a really neat story really neat aircraft and we're super honored that they asked us to come help them with it and help them get it back in the air where she belongs and where you guys can hopefully come out to an air show and see it and um, you know get a ride on it if possible. So here we have it. This particular aircraft was built by Boeing of Canada in 1943. Uh, she's been dubbed the Princess of the Stars, powered by two Pratt & Whitney R1830 14 cylinder radials so that's uh for those of you that don't know that's a front and a rear two row uh seven cylinders per bank so seven in the front seven in the rear twin row radial one on each side right thought i'd bring you in for a little closer look we are uh 
up on top of the fuselage here. And uh, as you can see, 1830 here, 1830 behind me over there. Now, if I recall, I want to say these engines are rated at about 1,200 horsepower per side. So 2,400 horsepower on tap to try to get this big flying kite off of the water. So for those of you that don't know, that wingtip way over there to that wingtip way over there is about 100-ish feet. I think maybe 104 thereabouts. So... Uh, yeah, there's a whole lot of wing up here. And I've got these two big radials to pull it up and try to get it off the water. And uh, as you can see, the catwalk is currently installed. And uh, this is a World War II service platform to be able to work on these motors. Now, this was set up in such a way that you can service these motors while this airplane is on the water. Now, should you drop a tool, I uh, can't help you there. But you can take one of these and one of those, which is the opposite side, and put it on the other side of the engine and completely work on all sides of this motor while over water. So, yeah, that's what they're meant for. But uh, while they're in a hangar environment like this, they're very handy to have, uh, especially on the inboard sides, because there's nothing that we can really stand on effectively between the engine and the fuselage. So makes a great service stand. As you can see, we've got scissor lifts down there and we put those on the outboard side, come up and we're able to service the motors on the outboard side with those. So that is why those are currently there and that's what they are for. So they're very lightweight constructed. Uh, they're meant to fold up and get stored in the airplane and take with you on your long trips across the Pacific or the Atlantic, whichever the case may be. So yeah, this thing has been down for uh, a lot of minor maintenance items, changing a lot of gaskets and seals, trying to tight, tidy up some leaks and fix a few things. Um, tighten up some worn parts, replace some things, uh, usual type of maintenance that uh, these kinds of airplanes need. I mean, this airplane's 80 years old. Uh, it needs it needs some help where uh, things are frequently used and frequently worn. So we got to come in and get everything fixed up. So for those unfamiliar with the PBY, uh, these are the upper hatches over the pilot's and co-pilot seat. Co-pilot seat's currently not installed. Pilot's, however, is. Uh, they slide rearward. And, um, you know, you got to think like a boat. Uh, the water line is uh, just below that little black footstep there. And so you got to be able to get out and get to the mooring points of the airplane and also... Um, you got to be able to get up to the service points of the engine, check oil, uh, do whatever you need to be. So that's one of the ways out of the airplane, uh, that hatch being another. And so what you do is there's a factory footstep right here. And this particular airplane has some handles here, which are very helpful. So you can kind of grab here and pull yourself up. And that gets you up on top of the wing now this wing is probably about six feet shorter in cord cord is distance from the leading edge to the trailing edge um, so this wing right now is about six feet shorter than normal because the trailing edges are off uh, one of them is right there on the ground the other over there on a sawhorse um, those big long gray things those are the ailerons. Those things are about 20 feet long. They go way out there. The skinny white thing is the section of the trailing edge that the aileron mounts to that also goes way out there. Now, what a lot of people might not realize is this wing is aluminum to there. Everything behind this point is an aluminum truss structure covered in fabric so all of those items are fabric covered they look big and massive and they are but they are extremely lightweight um, 
one person could pick them up if they had to, but they're just bulky, so um, we use two. However, um, yeah, what you don't see are the other two trailing edge sections that are roughly 20 feet long and about six foot tall. So all that covers this entire expanse, wingtip to wingtip. So that's one of the things we're here helping with is we're getting all those uh, prepped and ready to reinstall and we're going to be helping reinstall those here in a few days. Uh, the other thing is we've just been going around tidying up a lot of loose end projects that have been going on on both motors. Um, like I said, leak fixes, little um, small squawk items, um, just general maintenance stuff, making sure everything's good and happy. Um, so that's where we're at with that. Now, the other thing is obviously back there at the back, um, both elevators are still off. The rudder, however, is on. We actually just reinstalled that about two days ago. That rudder is, um, I don't know, probably about 10 or 12 feet tall and about five feet wide. It is pretty significant massive. Now, yeah, we've been bad about leaving some tools up there. We're getting the fairings put on back there and um, fixing some hardware problems and things like that. So that's why that stuff's up there. Um, but yeah, we're getting her tidied up and getting it put back together to get her in good prime flying shape to be able to do some flying and have some fun this summer. Another thing I wanted to point out while I'm up here on the wing is uh, this is an attach angle for the outboard section of wing there. But from that attach angle all the way across over to that attach angle way over there, um, that is pretty much all fuel tank. Uh, yeah, this uh, this was one of the first, if not the first aircraft to use a wet wing. So it's a riveted aluminum structure and the internal surfaces are covered in sealant. And so this whole thing is a integral fuel tank. Um, I believe the capacity is something on the order of 1,750 gallons, I, if I'm not mistaken. So that would allow, we figure a fuel burn, I wanna say about 100 gallons an hour, eh, give or take, now it's probably a little more than that, maybe about 150. I don't know, 100 to 150 gallons an hour um, fuel burn and 1,750 gallons of fuel on board. This thing is going to stay up for quite a while. Uh, one thing I did learn recently that I did not know is there was actually bladders sometimes in the in the self-sealing, I'm sorry, uh, there was actually bladders in the fuel tanks that... Um, they, the Navy actually would use these in the Pacific to haul diesel fuel. So they would fill up one fuel tank with avgas and run engines on regular gasoline, you know, avgas gasoline. And the bladders, um, they would put diesel fuel in and use these as flying tankers to get fuel out to the Pacific Islands to work all the tractors and equipment when they were constructing airfields. So the Navy Seabees would get their fuel via... PBY fuel tanks. So that was kind of a neat bit of trivia that I wasn't aware of. All right, weaseled my way from the front to the back via the uh, rather treacherous little path here. And for those of you that are wondering what's in a PBY pylon, well, the pylon being the section that attaches the fuselage to the wing, here you go, it's wide open. So we've got our aileron and trim cables back here wing attach fitting and then further up we've got fuel tank sumps fuel lines and this hatch that you see slid open this is the engineer station and uh, obviously there's a fairing stuffed in there right now for storage but uh, there would be a guy that sat in a seat right here and this was his window he had one on each side um, and he had the gauge panels for the engines and he could uh, adjust mixtures and prop settings, uh, fine tune 
the mixtures and props for the long duration flights. And he was the engineer, and so this was his station. He sat right there. Um, I've sat there on flight personally, and I will tell you it is one of the loudest positions, if not the loudest position, on a PBY. And um, it's uh, probably on board with about uh, B-25 interior noise levels for those of you that have had the fortune of flying in a B-25. So... Uh, the reason being is engines right there, one on either side of your head pretty much, and so all that prop wash is just coming right through here and beating you up, uh, beating up your eardrums anyway. Um, so, yeah, interior of the PBY pylon. Right. So when the trailing edge is actually installed, it kind of comes back here and slopes down, and there's a couple of grab handles on either side, and so it's actually not too difficult to step from where I'm at here on top of the fuselage to the trailing edge of the wing and climb up that direction. So you don't have to do the little sketchy weasel alongside the pylon and try not to fall off the airplane. So if this airplane is on the water, um, that is your path from front to rear. You go up and over the wing, down the pylon, and walk down the fuselage. Now, factory was plenty thoughtful had these handy dandy handles that pull out of the side of the vertical to allow you to get up to the tail section do that for pre-flight purposes and general inspections make sure everything's um, as it should be moves the way it should in case you had to service anything back there that's your way up so Yeah, I hope you enjoyed this walk around. Um, we're pretty busy tidying up a, a lot of little miscellaneous loose end stuff. Um, I'll give you guys a, a rundown of some of the other stuff we've got going on, but I just wanted to show you around the airplane and kind of introduce you to a PBY and maybe uh, uh, let you see a few more things that you're not apt to see. Uh, say, if you approach one in a museum uh, that's all buttoned up, closed up, it's kind of neat to see some of the behind the side the, if I can talk it's kind of cool to see some of the behind the scenes stuff um the the who's it what's it how's it the, all the stuff that makes it work um so that's what we're here fixing um we're here making sure it's good in good shape and flight worthy and safe to be able to keep this airplane operating well into the future another kind of cool factoid about the PBYs. So this is a PBY 5A. So this was a later production considering this or the Catalina was designed in the 30s, first flown in the late 30s um, as a flying boat. It was not an amphibious aircraft, meaning it did not have wheels, did not have landing gear. Uh, this was sort of a factory uh, revision upgrade to the original PBY flying boat. So all this mechanism that you see here, the gear wells, wheels, tires, everything, um, wasn't in the original PBYs. And so uh, in order to get the airplanes out of the water to be able to service them, they actually had beaching gear. Now, what we have here is the upper segment of the beaching gear, and it installed with a pin under the strut into a pocket so we've got a little tongue here that goes up into the pocket it gets pinned in place and then two pins pin into some loops on the side of the fuselage and normally this would just be a strut and would have a couple of wheels down here have the same thing on the other side and then back at the tail it would have a tail wheel that again would just get bolted on so you'd have some poor navy sap that would have to wade into the water carrying this heavy thing trying not to drown himself while pinning the beaching gear into place in order for the airplane to be winched up on shore. And it would be towed with a tractor or a winch or what have you. So yeah, this was kind of cool. So this is actually the original upper portion of the beaching gear that's now used and modified for a jack pad. So when we do the gear swings, uh, we just lift the jacks here uh, secure under the nose, not with that, secure under the nose, and we have a tail jack to hold the tail, uh, keep it from uh, shifting on us, 
and that's how we'll do the gear swing so the main gear kind of uh sucks up this this upper strut breaks in the hinge point in the middle gets pulled in the whole wheel goes up and settles right into the pocket there the nose gear um, just kind of rotates back rearward and has doors that close it so kind of a cool bit of history there that i wanted to share with you guys so remember how I said the trailing edges were fabric covered aluminum structure. It's a truss structure. Um, they're very simple, very lightweight. Uh, I want to bring you guys in for a little bit closer look at one we've got down here on the bench. So this is the trailing edge portion that the ailerons actually attach to. So you can see the aileron hinge points here. Those are all aileron hinges. Now, so this is the outboard wing section. So this is pretty small. It's about, I don't know, two feet. In cross section at the wide point it gets skinnier down there um, but as you can see there's not much going on in here it's just aluminum uh, extrusion L extrusion a lot of it's I don't know about half five eighths of an inch um, in cross section and that is it it is all fabric so this is a very large but very lightweight structure you can see where the aileron hinges are, there's some more structure that gets bolted in, beefier bolts, beefier structure. That takes the air loads, the aileron hinges. But uh, beyond that, it's a very lightweight, um, yet strong structure uh, that makes up the trailing edge of the wing. Over here we have another trailing edge section this is uh just inboard of the ailerons so from uh, roughly about here on the wing to right about there um this is about eight foot long roughly six foot front rear there maybe five over here as a matter of fact this is the uh, inboard aileron hinge right there um so we've got a couple extras of these over in the corner that uh, I want to show you guys what's going on in here. So over here we have a couple of sections of trailing edge and um, I wanted to show you guys because uh, this is this is what makes up the entire wing from that aft spar to the trailing edge. Um, it's just a lightweight aluminum truss structure and uh, you can see there's a couple of broken ones around here. Um, these are kept around as uh, part source. Um, these, you know, these airplanes aren't being made anymore. Um, you know, parts aren't readily available. So if we have parts around like this, uh, we can easily salvage a, a full truss or a section of a truss. Um, if need be, if any damage happens to occur, we have some extras that we can get parts out of. So very valuable to have this stuff around and that's why it's kept around. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is, it's a very, um, thin, probably 20, 25 thousandths thick material there, um, bent up into a structure and the structures are put together with a little aluminum forging in here. that's just riveted in place. And then we've got some gusset plates down here and really that is the truss and the whole thing is just, it's super lightweight. Um, you know, this is, um, I don't know, I'm going to guess, you know, 10, 15 pounds total. Um, you know, maybe more. I don't know. My elbow scale could be off. But you get the idea. It's extremely lightweight. And you put fabric on it, and it doesn't add much of any weight to it whatsoever. But you get a lot of surface area and lift. So that's what's important. But, uh, yeah, I wanted to show you guys that. It's kind of a, a cool thing to see, to see the inner workings of what's, the, what's going on and uh, what helps keep this thing flying in the air. All right, looking up at the bottom of the wing, we have the wing tip float. So you can see this section here, this whole float just retracts down 90 degrees and uh, that's where your floats come from and that's where they're stored. They're nice and streamlined for flight. But uh, they look fairly smallish when they're up there. But uh, when you get down here at ground level, uh, yeah, these things are the size of a canoe. And I'm pretty sure I've seen a number of them made into canoes during World War II. There's some kind of cool pictures of uh, guys that have made rafts and uh, canoes and whatnot out of uh, 
both drop tanks and floats of this nature. But uh, yeah, this thing is probably about uh, two and a half foot wide and I don't know, eight, eight to 10 feet long thereabouts. Um, pretty simple, built just like the airplane is, uh, aluminum monocoque structure. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, these are actually the old ones off of the airplane. Um, they're a little beat up. There's some corrosion issues going on in there. And so those that are actually on there now are the replacements. And I believe those were new old stock. Uh, so they were just installed this year. So brand new floats on the tips up there and kind of cool up on top of the, the pallet racks up there. Those are additional rudders again, great to keep around for spare parts. Uh, very valuable. We've got old motor that was removed um so good part source to have on hand if need be uh, i can go out and get overhauled and be ready to go on the airplane as a new replacement should we have any issues with what's up there so in order to keep uh, an 80 year old fly airplane flying you need a good supply of parts on hand Another kind of cool thing, we actually just got through installing brand new bearings uh, in both wheels, both main wheels, as well as new brake discs and stators, and completely rebuilding the brakes. So this is an amphibious aircraft. It goes in the water. The wheels, while retracted into the airplane, are still below the water line, which is about here. So. That whole wheel is underwater, so you think of like your boat trailer and your heavy duty grease and stuff like that. Well, you got basically the same thing going on in here. You got to try to be absolutely diligent about wheels, um, brakes, and wheel bearings, and checking conditions of everything, and flushing and drying everything off um, after we go in the water. Uh, or else um, we can wind up with some of the stuff going on here. Um, so these are a combination of some new old stock brake housing assemblies, um, new old stock parts, as well as some of the old used stuff that has come off. And when you go flying with an airplane that goes in the water, you wind up with rusty brakes if you're not careful. Um, so... Yeah, these are the old brake discs that were removed. Um, it's possible to go get them cleaned up and retreated and uh, usable again, um, which is why they're gonna get they're gonna be kept around. Um, but the airplane just got nice, fresh new discs put on, as well as fresh new bearings. Um, so this stuff is not junk you don't just throw away old parts you pretty much keep everything because you can use it for parts pieces or patterns um, whatever the case may be whatever the need may be all right welcome to probably one of the coolest seats in the house uh only thing that might rival it is actually being in the pilot seat at least for me i don't know about you if you're a passenger and you enjoy thoroughly being a passenger, uh, this is the place to be. So this is the gun blister. This is the original waste gun position. So there would have been, I believe, a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on a swivel inside a turret. Uh, well, inside this uh, bubble uh, blister assembly. And so the gun uh, was fully uh, pivotable up down left right and so you could defend the aircraft against enemy aircraft that might be coming in so you have one of these on this side one on that side uh, pardon my finger um, and anymore this is a couch as is this side so I will say from first-hand experience that this is a phenomenal place to be while the airplane is both in the water and in flight uh, because the water line is um, probably about two feet below this the edge of this window um, but the views are spectacular because in flight you can look sort of outside the surface of the airplane and get a fantastic view both forward uh, 
up and over the top as well as rearward and just the level of visibility from this position is just phenomenal out both sides and so the I mean if flying in a PBY alone isn't enough for you flying a PBY just to experience flying in this bubble this thing is cool walking you through the forward section of the airplane um, forgive the, the mess we're still working extensively in here so we've got a lot of tools and stuff tools and equipment around but uh, this is the flight deck and uh, kind of a cool thing we've got a the entry hatch here which I mean obviously it's wide open there but we have a door and this is actually a hatch just like a ship flying boat remember so they've got watertight doors kind of an interesting thing so yeah we have the cockpit now this is um, very period uh, with the, the skinny wheels and the whole up and over cross yoke it's it's a very unique design um, very reminiscent of the 30s which is kind of cool you've got overhead engine controls uh, throttles propellers um, all located overhead mixtures as well back here um, we've got some other engine gauges also back here so we've kind of got a, uh, a full 3D experience going on with uh, all the controls kind of located everywhere uh, within reach of pilot and co-pilot. Um, nose position was, is accessible under the, the instrument panel there. So you got to crawl on your hands and knees. Uh, this is the blister for where the nose wheel sits when it's retracted. Crawl on your hands and knees up under the instrument panel to get into the nose compartment. Uh, you won't do that in this airplane as it sits right now in flight because there's no reason to. That's a dark hole in flight. However, uh, in World War II configuration, um, this airplane would have a glass window up there in the nose. And that was where the bombardier sat. Remember, this was a patrol bomber. Emphasis on bomber. So there was a bombardier. Norden bombsite and bombsite window was up in the front. That was a glass window that looked forward and down. Now, slightly behind him and above was a gun turret. And it was a, a big circular rotatable turret. Again, elevation uh, and uh, rotation on the gun to be able to shoot enemy aircraft that may be attacking this thing. Because um, keep in mind... This was not a fast airplane. It is not a fast airplane. You're basically cruising at uh, about 100 miles an hour. Uh, that's, that's it. And with a 104 foot wing, you are a giant target. And you've got fast moving fighters that are capable of three and 400 miles an hour, uh, depending on circumstance, that could easily come in and attack you if you're in the wrong position at the wrong time. So you need to be able to defend your position, hence all the gun positions. There was the nose, the bet I call it nose turret, the bow turret. Um, you had the waist gun blisters. There was a dorsal turret that was actually in the bottom of the fuselage tail section that pointed down and rearward. And that was your defense to try to save you and your crew um, should you be attacked. So yeah, there was a nose turret up here. And um, currently this airplane as configured has what they call a clipper turret. So it has been modified to just have a curved uh, windowless uh, boat shaped turret, or I'm sorry, a curved windowless boat shaped hull to the nose. There's no glass, there's no turret, there's nothing. There's no reason to be up there unless you're mooring the airplane, throwing the anchor out, which, it's kind of interesting. An airplane with an anchor. Who'd have thought? Anyway. Um, yeah, so on the future list of projects for this airplane, they actually want to reinstall the World War II nose. So there will be a glass window and the gun turret in, in the nose. And so that will be um, happening in the future, which is really, really cool. And I look forward to seeing that happen. 
So the compartment just aft of the pilot seat is the radio operator and navigator would all be in this area. Um, so this airplane's been modified. This hatch would not be here from the factory. That was totally closed off and that was the navigator's chart table and whatnot was all here. This is not a chart table for them. Uh, the chart table would be up here. Navigator would sit up here. Radio operator and all his radios would be all in this area. And um, so this airplane has been modified. It's been an airliner. It's been a tanker. It's had a lot of changes over the years. And so what you see here isn't the way it was configured during World War II. Um, however, they're making some efforts to change it towards a more stock configuration. So, um, yeah, this is the compartment just after the pilot seats. Um, as it's currently configured, there's going to be a seat over here, a couple of seats over here. Um, and so after that, this is the inside of where the landing gear is. Uh, landing gear, one there, one there. This was the original galley. And so this airplane, like I said, had 1,750 some odd gallons of fuel on board. It could stay up for a very long time. So you got to feed and water the crew. Um, so it had basic kitchen facilities in this area. Now, as we go through here, aft of this, as currently configured, we have seating, which is fantastic. Um, and in this compartment, in World War II was actually the bunk compartment. You actually had racks for guys to sleep in um, on either side. Um, this is also kind of used as cargo and things like that um, in this area. Um, but this is the bunk compartment, if you will. So right now it's configured for seating and we've got some fantastic viewing windows which uh, provide for a phenomenal uh, viewing experience and then after the bunk compartment we're back at the blisters now we've already talked about these a bit and so aft of the blisters um, in this airplane we have an air stair door which is super convenient uh, however not original and not originally equipped as such so originally when you would go through this hatch right here in the floor was a removable hatch and that hatch would swing up out of the way and you had a gun that could swing down into position and that was your dorsal gun that was your defense against any enemy that came from the rear in addition to the blisters that could shoot somewhat aft um, you had the dorsal gun that could against uh, defend against any attacker from the rear and below um, so this was actually originally a gunner's position um, but it's now been converted to an air stair, which makes entrance and egress from the aircraft uh, super easy. I just wanted to take a quick moment to say thank you to the Soaring by the Sea Foundation for uh, graciously inviting us to come out here and help them with their airplane. Um, it's a tremendous honor to keep history like this alive, and honestly, it's what we got into this for. This is why we do it. Um, we love this stuff and love keeping it going, keeping it um, visible uh, in the public eye to, to see at air shows. Um, you know, it, it's the experience, uh, the sensory experience of these airplanes, the sights, the sounds, the smells, um, the tangibles. You can, you know, go for a ride on this thing and it, it really can, can take you right back um, to understand our history and understand what it was like for the guys that you know flew these during the war and um you know even flew them as fire bombers and stuff like that it's really kind of a, a neat bit of history and we're super honored and extremely grateful that uh, we were asked to come out and help them with this and i want to say thanks to soaring by the seas foundation and uh, everybody that is involved with it that uh, asked us to do so if you guys are at all curious about this particular airplane, uh, check out the Soaring by the Sea Foundation online. Check out their website. Um, call them up, make an appointment, uh, come out, tour the airplane, uh, take a ride on it. Um, all of your support helps keep this airplane in the air, keeps it flying, uh, and helps the maintenance. Uh, these things just 
they gobble fuel. Uh, maintenance and parts aren't cheap. And so, uh, you know, all your help um, goes right back into the airplane and makes this survive into the future so our next generations can can get the same experience. Um, so, yeah, check them out online, uh, follow them, and uh, help them out. Keep this thing in the air. Thank you.